Hello, I'm Amara Jones reporting with FSTV from Netroots Nation in Philadelphia where this gathering of digital and offline activists are figuring out and talking about what is the way forward after last year's victories in 2018 into 2020. And so that's why we are thrilled, I am personally thrilled, to be talking again to now Congresswoman <laughs> Deb Holland, who represents the first district of New Mexico. When we spoke last year, that was not quite the case. No, I was it. I was, let's see, last year I was, I had won my primary, right, right. so I was working on my general election, so I was still a candidate. Now I'm a member. Now you are a member. How have you found your first, what, seven months now in the Congress? What is it, What and in what way does it um, differ from what you expected? So, first of all, I'm blessed. I'm, I'm humbled and honored to represent the people of New Mexico because we're, you know, we're, we're a, a state and, and a community where people have lived there for generations and generations. I, uh, I'm a 35th generation New Mexican. There's a lot of people like me who live in my district. So, you know, it's it's like I'm representing uh, culture and heritage and history and and also you know the values that that we all have. We we're like a big family. We want everyone to succeed. We want every child to have a quality public education. So um, I won. I didn't tell you this probably, but I won my seat with 23 percent of the vote. I won by 23 percent in my general election. So that tells me that people want uh, want me to push forward with renewable energy, climate, you know, fighting climate change, public education, health care for everyone. And so those are the things I'm working on. And also, you know, just working on trying to find ways to, in a way, to heal our country, I think. One of the things that you mentioned last year was the fight for climate change was your number one issue. Um, and I'm wondering how you have found fighting for that in the Congress, and particularly in, with the administration that we have now, and how you balance um, bread and butter issues like that, that concern your district, with um, the larger platform that you have also um, found yourself in as um, a champion of indigenous peoples in the, in the Congress, breaking barriers as the first person, indigenous person, to actually wield the gavel and chair um, the House of Representatives. Um, you know, how do you balance those that as a Congress person who has these um, issues that you're working on versus the way in which you are also a symbol? So, first of all, with respect to the climate issue, I'm on the, uh, so I'm on, one of the committees I'm on is the House Natural Resources Committee. Do you, you may not know this, but 25% of carbon comes from our public lands here in this country. I didn't know that. 25%. That's a huge number. It's because, it's because we keep selling uh, leasing land for gas and oil for fossil fuel industry projects, and we need to stop doing that. So we've had a, a number of hearings on climate change on that issue. Um, there is a bill in the House right now that myself and Congressman Ben Ray Lujan and some other folks uh, sponsored. It is to protect Chaco Canyon from gas, oil and gas drilling and fracking uh, within a 10-mile radius of that, uh, you know, that amazing um, ancient town of Chaco Canyon. So, so, I mean, that's a Native American sacred site. The, the bones of my ancestors are buried there. Uh, we need to protect places like that. It goes for Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante and oh, any wow. other, right? So we're working hard to protect those. And I think in the process, uh, we can scale back those, you know, the, the carbon that is spewing into the atmosphere from, those, from that industry. Um, additionally, like being the first Native woman, of course, I, I, uh, I feel uh, that it's my job to make sure that tribes have a seat at the table. So during the hearings that we're having uh, on, on climate change, on missing and murdered indigenous women, on our national parks and monuments that the Trump administration is just trying to slash in half every time you turn around, uh, tribal leaders and tribal folks are at the table 
uh, giving their perspective on these issues. I, I want to make sure that they have a voice in Congress. Can, um, can you talk about the, the plight of missing Indigenous women? Mm -hmm. um, what from the hearings and from your um, exploration of the issue is driving that? And why do you think it hasn't gotten more attention? Because it is beyond a crisis. Yes, it is. It, it indeed is. It, uh, and you know, since I, that was one of the issues in my campaign that I campaigned on uh, very, um, very progressively, vigorously. Uh, vigorously. And um, so, so far I've filed about four bills on that issue. One of those is the Not Invisible Act of 2019 that convenes, uh, the law will convene a committee of people, including law enforcement agencies, um, missing and murdered indigenous women victims or their families, also the advocates who work on that issue. We want them to find how we can remedy this crisis, right? So they're going to get together, they're going to give recommendations to Congress on how we can fight that. And I think a lot of people just don't know what to do about it. And so that's what we need to research. And there's there's been a lot of uh, research and reporting on this issue, but we need to bring all those people together in, you know, to one table so that we can have a clear understanding of what it is Congress has to do to solve that crisis. Uh, I went to a missing and murdered indigenous women a hearing uh, at the Senate Indian Affairs Committee. That was before I actually was sworn into office, and one of the victim's sisters was there testifying. And she talked about seeing her sister's sweater on the side of the road. And they alerted the police to that. Three days later, they went back and the sweater was still there. So do we need training for um, the native, you know, for the tribal police? Do they, do they know how to collect and process evidence? Do we need, you know, do we need training or do we need, I mean, what is it that we need to make sure? You know, the movie Wind River came out and, and um, it kind of highlighted the issue. However, in the movie, it showed the FBI swooping in as soon as the girl was killed, and that doesn't happen, right? The FBI decides whether they should take on that case or not. Uh, they weigh their manpower and, you know, do, can they spare somebody to go all the way out to a remote Indian tribe or Indian community to investigate a murder? And so that doesn't always happen the way uh, it does in Hollywood. So we want it to happen for real. We want, we want them to pay attention to our native sisters, our grandmothers, our mothers, our children who are t missing. I mean, the interesting thing as well is that it's a trend, right? So it's not only a United States phenomenon, the exact same thing is happening in Canada. Yes, and you have to know that, I said earlier on my panel, this country was founded on genocide of Indians. Violence against Native women, murder, you know, missing and murdered Indigenous women, it didn't just start happening in the last few generations. It's been happening since the Europeans, Europeans came to this country. So once we start studying this issue, I think it's going to reveal a lot of facts that some of us are going to find very, very hard to um, accept. Exactly. Um, one of the things that's hot in the news is the fact that um, there is supposedly, and maybe it's not as um, white hot as it appears in the press, is supposedly between the speaker and uh, people from marginal districts, the 40 or so people who got elected from Trump districts, and um, the squad as they call themselves. Um, uh, and so I'm wondering, as a newly elected person in the Congress, as a woman of color, um, uh, how are you actually finding um, the, the atmosphere in the caucus um, to you and your issues? And what um, do you think about this, the, this supposed tension? Is it normal? Is it... You know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. It's my first term, so yeah. I don't know what first happened. First seven months? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't say, you know, I'm not an expert on relationships in Congress. But I can tell you this, that we all have a job to do, and it's to fight for our communities. It's not to fight each other. 
Uh, I'd really love for this so-called feud to, um, you know, just to subside so that we can all get back to, to making sure that we're fighting for the people who really need it. Uh, you know, a state party chair of New Mexico, I was the Democratic state That's chair right. for two years for one term. Um, I worked extremely hard to build relationships with people across the entire state to, you, you know, to unify the party so that we could elect Democrats in 2016, and we did exactly that. So uh, I have a history of building relationships with people. I really, um, I really feel that's the best way for me to get things done for my district and, and you know, the country as a whole. And so, um, and, and also I have to say that uh, I have never felt sidelined. Uh, I have found tremendous support with all of my colleagues uh, in the Congress for all the things that I want to do. If I ask somebody to sign on to a bill that I'm uh, introducing, uh, you know, my first bill, I had 70 co-sponsors. Wow. So, um, so I'm going to continue to do that. Um, I'm grateful for the speaker's leadership uh, in so many ways. You know, she, she, look, she kept Trump from coming in to the State of the Union until <laughs> our government opened, right. right? And so she's bold in, in that way. I hope that, um, you know, they can find a way to just resolve whatever issues they're having and, and hope that, you know, I mean, I'm 58 years old, uh, I'm, a, I'm a mom, to, and I was a mom to a teenage daughter who, uh, who gave me grief every day, and I, you know, I learned how to navigate that, and I just feel like all of us, if we dig deep, we can... Um, you know, we can forgive each other. We can realize that what we're here to do is fight for the American people because we, we know that our better days have to be ahead because there's so many horrible things happening right now. And the people we should be fighting are Mitch McConnell, Donald Trump, Mike Pence, and all the people who were keeping those kids in cages and everything else that's going awry, you know, the climate change deniers and all the things that are ruining our country right now, that's who we need to be fighting and standing up for the people of this country, working families. Right, that's right. Um, one last question is, um, I'm wondering if what your insights are for 2020 in terms of presidential candidates, mm -hmm. if you were to advise them about ways that you think that they can um, activate and build, one, an right. intersectional coalition mm -hmm. like you did to win, which I think is one of the most fascinating things about your race is how you reached out to African Americans, you reached out to like, Every, build a broad The LGBTQ coalition. community, yes, the disability did. community, did the every, veterans. Did that. Yes, I, I, I just feel like, so, kind of, I guess, my, a little, kind of my message for this conference is, uh, I, run an I ran an unapologetically progressive campaign. And I messaged that campaign to anyone who would listen, and I, I went above and beyond to make sure that everybody heard my message. And I won by 23 points in a plus seven Democratic district. So that means that not only Democrats, but Republicans and independents voted for me because our message resonated with them. And I believe very strongly that a progressive platform and a progressive message will resonate with this entire country because there are more of us who have been right. sidelined. There are more of us who haven't been able to pay the rent and buy food at the same time. There are more of us who can't afford to buy insulin, which That's is right. a life-saving drug in this country. So why are we not all on the same team fighting to make sure that we have somebody in the White House who cares every single day and will fight every single day for all of us? So I am going to be out there. I don't know who our nominee will be right no now, does. but whoever our Democratic nominee is, uh, I, as soon as I get back to New Mexico, I'm signing the Indivisible Pledge because they asked me to come and do it at their meeting, so I'm going to do that. Uh, whoever wins, I'm fighting to make sure that a Democrat wins the White House and that uh, in New Mexico, of course, that we uh, elect Democrats up and down the ticket. So one last question, and maybe we can do this as a web extra. Um, there's a there's a distinct possibility that our nominee will be a woman and that her name is Warren. Right, There's, it could be Kamala Harris, it could be any of these other uh -huh. things. If she is the nominee, it's undoubted the fact that 
Donald Trump is going to smear her with the moniker of Pocahontas. That's going to be the way that he, one way he does that. Can you talk about why that is just such an offensive term? Because for him, it's a term of amusement. Right, it's a yes, term because of... yes, because he's extremely ignorant. He's, <laughs> he's, he is the most ignorant on American history. Right, he talked about having airports in the 1700s. <laughs> right, it's true. So um, look, I am. That is really old. Yes, it's old and tired. Uh, he's not funny. No. Uh, he knows nothing about Native Americans. If that's the only name he knows from Indian history, uh, God help him because he doesn't know anything. <laughs> right. So um, I think that um, whatever message we have as a party, as a nominee, and if that nominee is Elizabeth Warren, uh, she's been fighting for working families for as long as I can remember. And her message of, uh, of fighting for those working families and making sure that everybody has a chance to succeed, that we have an economy that works for every single person, not just the rich billionaires at the top. Uh, my guess is that she'll be able to overcome anything that President Trump throws at her. And all of us in this room, if she is our nominee, we're going to make sure that we help her to do that. Whoever the nominee is. Whoever the nominee is. <laughs> Whoever it is. Well, thank you for joining us. Um, it's been fantastic to know you, you as a candidate and now as a congressperson. Thank you. Um, you just give me and so many people thank so you. much hope. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you for being here for all of us. Of course. Okay. And thank you for joining us in FSTV. Stay tuned.